Hi, Richie. Hi, Sam. Hi, everyone. Today, we have a very special podcast with a very special guest. Introduce yourself, special guest. Um, hi, I'm Vlad. Um, I'm here to talk about Elder Scrolls lore. Oh my god! The Vlad? Vlad Seltanar was the Prince of Wallachia. <laughs> Thank you, Google. <laughs> I'd like to point out that before that happened, Sin was saying, Google doesn't listen to me when I'm talking. <laughs> And can you tell us, Vlad, what are we going to be talking about specifically? Um, today we are going to be talking about a character from the games called uh, Talos. He's, uh, he's one of the Nine Divines. Is he the one with the Infinity Fist and the stones? No, that's a different one, I'm pretty sure. Can we add a little snare drum in there? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sin, before we start, let's talk about our experiences with Skyrim and with Elder Scrolls. What a great idea! You first! <laughs> I played a little bit of Oblivion. I don't know anything about it. I played the opening tutorial of Skyrim. And then when I got out of the village, I thought, this game is too big. And, <laughs> and I have played Daggerfall a bit because I like the aesthetic of Daggerfall, but I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richie. Well, I played about a couple of hundred of hours of Skyrim, and I also don't know anything about it. Cool. <laughs> what about you, Vlad? I have played a few thousand hours of Skyrim. I was uh, really big into it back when it came out. I was, like, just going into high school at the time. So I played that game a lot. I've played a little bit of Oblivion, not nearly as much as Skyrim. I played the third game a quite a bit. That one's called Morrowind. And um, I, I played uh, Daggerfall 2. Um, I mostly just committed petty crimes and um, got thrown in jail a lot. <laughs> so that's my experience with the series. Excellent. Thank you. So, Vlad. Uh, yes. You actually made an outline. <laughs> Could you guide us through the outline? Uh, do you want me to go through all the points real quick before we start? Good idea. Yes. Like I said earlier, we're talking today specifically about Talos. I've kind of ordered things so they go from nice and simple and then progressively get more and more kind of wild and conspiracy theory-like. So to begin uh, with point number one, we have the Third Empire of Man and the Septim Dynasty. Then we have uh, two, the downfall of the Third Empire. Number three is uh, the birth of the Ninth Divine. Number four is Talos Worship in the Fourth Era of Skyrim. Followed up by why everything Fourth Era Nords believe is wrong and why they're dumb. <laughs> number six is three men in a trench coat and how to become a god. Seven is T A L O S and the Numidian Velothi connection. Of course, of course. Of course. <laughs> number eight is Thalmor Theocide and why elves hate Talos. And then number nine, I just kind of lumped every crazy little fact I knew about Talos from like random sources I read a while ago and couldn't find again. Uh, that one is Space Battles, Exploding Paintings, The Bachelor Party at the End of the Universe, and Kind. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Number six sounds like a Reborn spinoff. Now that I'm looking at it, it kind of does, and I, I don't know if I should regret that or not. <laughs> I guess we'll see when we get to number six. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, as we told you before we started recording, we don't know anything about this, so it's all you. <laughs> 
All right, so the Third Empire of Man and the Septim Dynasty. Skyrim's timeline is broken up in two eras. There's the Merithic era, which came first, and then after that there was the first, second, third, and fourth era. Skyrim actually takes place in the fourth era. All the other games take place in the third. So, like, Arena, Daggerfall, Morrowind, and Oblivion, um, they all take place in, like, the last... 40, maybe? Like, the last 40 years of the Third Era? Okay, I've, I've got a question about that. Yeah. Are all the Elder Scrolls games, like, sequential historically in the order they were released, or are, like they set at different time periods? Completely. All the main titles come out, like, they're in sequential order, so, like, Arena right. happens first, then... Daggerfall happens, like, 12 years after that. Morrowind happens, like, 20 years after that. Oblivion happens a couple years after that. And then there's a huge jump between Oblivion and Skyrim, where that's, like, 200 years in the future. Right. But for the most part, they all kind of take place in a sequential order, but they don't, like, affect each other much. Right. Like, you'll hear references. Like, there's books in Skyrim talking about the things that happened in the game Oblivion. And, like, in Oblivion, you can overhear people talking about what happened to the main character of the third game after the events of the game. But, like, you never... Well, allegedly, you never meet, like, the other characters you played as. They have... The heroes in those games have a tendency to just kind of fade into obscurity after they do what they're supposed to do. Right. So, like, um, the Nerevarine goes, like, they think he went to, like, a different continent after he got done doing all the crazy stuff he did. And, um, the one from Oblivion might have become a god, <laughs> but I don't, I don't know, because uh, he might have become the god of madness, but, yeah. I mean, the God of Madness, by, like, his nature, isn't supposed to make any sense, so... Right. I don't really know about that one. And then, assumedly, at the end of Skyrim, like, in the next game, they'll kind of just say, oh, the Dragonborn, after he did all that stuff, kind of just went away. Uh-huh. Right. But yeah. Um, kind of lost my train of thought. Where was I? Oh, uh, the different eras. So... Right. Okay. Each era is kind of defined by the empire that rules it. So there's the Alessian Empire of the first era, the Raymon Empire of the second era, the Septim Dynasty of the third, and then the Mede Emperors of the fourth. Right. Talos was the founder of the third empire, and he did it back when he was still a man named Tiber Septim. So... Near, like, the end of the Second Era, like, the Raymond Empire that had ruled at the start of the Second uh, Era had completely fallen. They had, like, a huge, basically, like, um, a Golden Age, and then that whole empire kind of crumbled in on itself. All the different countries that had been under the empire were either engaged in, like, civil wars or trying to, like, rebuild an empire out of the whole continent. And the first person to really do that was um, Tiber Septim. He, according to legend, was a Nord man. The Nords are the kind of the main people who live in Skyrim. They're the natives. And he, he was a general under an army of a man, I think, whose name was Kula Kane. I might be wrong about that. But um, he, under Kula Kane's rule, used. Um, the Thum, and founded the Third Empire. Oh, can you just explain what he used, the, the Thum? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, in Skyrim, the Thum is like the dragon shout abilities you have. Right. According to legend, like he was a dragonborn, like the main character of Skyrim was, so he could just kind of do that. Right. Which we'll get into later down, probably around number five, which is why Nords are wrong about everything about Talos. 
But yeah, so according to legend, um, using the power of the Thum, he started the Third Empire, and then over the next couple decades after he founded it, he slowly brought every other country on the continent under this Third Empire, which was the first time the entire continent of Tamriel had been under one empire. Third Era lasted for, I think, around 300 years. During that time, for the most part, especially like towards the start, it was pretty peaceful. The way he had conquered the continent was, um, it really like put a lot of fear into all the like smaller provinces, so that for the most part there was peace, regardless of whether or not that peace was like they agreed with the empire or they were just really scared of the empire. Didn't really matter to Tiber Septim. I'm trying to think of anything that happened during the invasion, like, during his invasions. He did employ the use of a giant robot, which sounds (laughs) nuts, but Sin, you know, um, you know when you go into, like, the dwarven ruins and there's those big, like, um, robot guys, the dwarven centurions? Yeah. He found one of those, well, he didn't find it, he was given, it was, like, gifted to him. He got one of those that was basically the size of, like, a mountain. Mm -hmm. And so he just kind of marched that around the whole continent and was like, hey, you guys should surrender or else my giant robot is going to crush everything. Was he, like, cosplaying Escaflone? I don't know what that is. I don't don't know. (laughs) What? What? Cascaflone? What? Escaflone! Oh, Escaflone, I thought you said Escaflone. And Kaflone is like some reborn character I haven't seen yet. <laughs> oh, it's more reborn stuff. No, no, it's 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 Escaflone. It's uh, an anime about like fantasy world, but with giant robots. Yeah, I make I make a relevant comment, and Richie just ruins it. And Vlad doesn't even know because he was probably not even born when that was released. <laughs> he probably wasn't. It came out April second, nineteen ninety six. Yep. Okay, yeah, it's older than me. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a little upsetting. No, for us it is. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's upsetting for us. It's not it shouldn't be upsetting for I you. Don't care, bro. Do you care how old you are? I'm glad I'm getting old. The more of the uh, adolescence and young adulthood I live behind me, the better. Buy school, buy university. <laughs> you work at a university. Shut up. (laughs) I do as well. (laughs) Good reference, Sin. Very nice. Bravo. (laughs) Yeah, so I I have to assume it's exactly like whatever that thing Sin just mentioned was. He just kind of marched his big robot called the Numidium around the continent and was like, hey, surrender or you're all going to die. And everyone was like... All right, we'll surrender. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> and then the Septims, like I said, they ruled for like 300, 400 years. During that time, um, there weren't any like outside invasion attempts. I think there was one guy who was like a wood elf who tried to invade. But honestly, a lot of the more interesting stuff from the Third Era happens in the other games near like the end of the Empire. Right. All right, this is going to sound weird as an offhanded comment, but I do think at one point, like, a giant snake lady was the emperor for a while. I'm cool with that. <laughs> okay, as long as we're all okay with that. Do you, you want to go into detail about the snake lady? There's not a whole lot written about when she was emperor, or empress, I guess. Basically, there's another continent way to the east of Tamriel called Akavir. It has a race of snake people who have occasionally tried to come over and invade Tamriel, but they usually get distracted. All right, so um, do you guys know who the Blades are in Skyrim? Like, kind of the samurai-looking guys with, like, the katanas and everything? No. I, all I know about Skyrim is that you're in a cart, and then a dragon attacks a village, and then you eventually leave, and you can be a frog. <laughs> Every time the, um, they're called, like, the... Saseki. Their name's hard to pronounce, but every once in a while they come over, they try to invade. 
they usually do a pretty good job until they get distracted. And then they usually just end up like joining whatever government's already there and forsaking their homeland. So like one of the first times they came was during um, the Raymond Empire back when Raymond Sirod, the founder of the Raymond Empire, was still in charge. And they saw him and they're just like, oh, forget what we came here for. We're just going to like listen to this guy. And that's how the Blades came around. Which is like um, kind of the Imperial spy network from that point on. They're they're a pretty big part in Morrowind and um, Oblivion. They're kind of, they're a really weird faction in Skyrim, and no one almost ever joins them because um, honestly, they're just kind of mean. I was just saying I don't want to spoil it, but Skyrim's like nine years old now, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be twenty eleven. Yeah, there's a, they want you to kill this dragon in order to, like, join them, but he's a really cool dragon, and he's, like, the only really cool dragon you meet, so, like, no one ever joins the Blades, so they kind of suck in Skyrim. <laughs> so anyway, this snake lady had come over from there and then assumed the throne just because I think no one else was there to really do it, so I think she just took over temporarily until, like, an heir came and retook the throne. But that's all I really know about that. By Snake Lady, like, was she, like, half person, half snake? No one really knows. Um, you never seen a Tseki in the game. They're just referred to as, like, golden-scaled vampire snake men. Ooh. So, um, like I said, you've never seen them in the whole, like, lore of the games. Akavir has always just kind of been referred to as, like, this faraway land that nobody really knows about. A few people have been there, and even fewer have come back alive. So no one really knows. Okay. Thank you. The really interesting events in the Third Era mostly happen towards the end. And those are the events of the first four Elder Scrolls games. That's um, in Arena, the Empire gets sent uh, basically to Hell and replaced by his Archmage. The hero in that game has to go put eight pieces of a staff back together, come back, kill the wizard, and put the emperor back on the throne. Second game, you basically just, uh, in Daggerfall, you dig up the giant robot from before and give it over to the empire. I never beat Daggerfall, so I'm not entirely sure. Morrowind is when things get really complicated, because you... you kill a couple gods, and... It's not really, like, it's not super important for, like, the whole of the Empire itself, but it's, like, a devastating thing in the country of Morrowind, because these have been their god kings for, like, 3,000 years. Which will probably come back up later, so just keep that in mind. Morrowind is always, like, super overly important in the lore, because the guy who wrote it, you can tell, really prefers them over any other people. Yeah, there's, a. There's a, a games writer I follow, and she's very, very into the the politics of Morrowind, basically. She says it's extremely well thought out representation of colonialism. Like Yeah, beyond, it's... Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I played Morrowind pretty extensively. It's a super in-depth game. Really confusing, really weird, but really good. And then in Oblivion, um, Richie, you mentioned that like you, the Emperor comes down to your cell... Yeah. And then is almost immediately stabbed to death. <laughs> yes. So that whole game is about finding his um long lost son, putting him on the throne, and then the second you do, he also almost immediately dies. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the last um true Septim heir. So that's the end of the Septim dynasty. So I kinda went into point two there on accident, but we're doing all right. Yeah. The third point I have here is the birth of the Ninth Divine, and then in brackets I have again. So the whole, like, the religion of the Empire is the worship of the Nine or the Eight Divines, depending on what time period you're in. At the end of his reign, um, when he passed away, Tiber Septim the Man is said to have basically ascended to heaven 
kind of conferred with the other divines, and then they sort of raised him to that status. That's kind of the belief of the people of the Third Era, and um, kind of into the Fourth Era. The, the idea gets a little bit more controversial in the Fourth Era, and we'll get into that later. Just know that for the most part, the common belief is that when he died, he was just so... He was basically just so cool as a person that they decided that he gets to be a god. So after that, he joined the Pantheon, and there were nine divines again. The gods decided he could be a god, or...? That's what people believe. So he went to, like, the Heaven Realm in Elder Scrolls, which is called Ethereus, and according to, like, the legend and the mytho- or the religion of the Empire, it's never really explained how, but he just kind of ascended. Like, he was such a powerful figure in his, like, in his life and in the world that he just kind of by his feet, almost like Hercules, I guess, would be a good way to, like, to compare it to real life. Right. And I'm kind of getting to fourth era Skyrim uh, worship of Talos because that's probably what most people are familiar with, and I'm guessing Sin to some extent. You're probably a little familiar with that as well. I'm just Googling Worship of Talos real quick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Sin, do you remember like the first big city you go to in the game? No. Okay, do you... Have you guys seen the memes of like the guy standing in front of the statue who's always yelling in that one town? No. No. <laughs> Hang on. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yelling was he yelling at talos he was yelling at people about talos he was like a priest of talos and he would i think his name was heimskir oh yep yep i see him okay he's wearing like a yellow hood yeah that's him yeah caption says you motherfuckers need talos yeah that sounds about right yeah. that's basically oh. the gist of his speech <laughs> yeah i see right. it too. okay all right so um, I'm just kind of going to talk about Talos worship in general for a bit, because it differs from, like, culture to culture. In in the Empire, he's kind of thought of as the god of, like, mankind. Because he was once a mortal, he's kind of um, the god that mortals look to the most for, like, inspiration. Because the other gods are, like, gods of, like, time, commerce... You know, important stuff, but Talos was, like, the the main one people looked to. He was kind of, like, the hero god. Like I said, um, I don't know much about Hercules, but from what I do know about it, he was kind of like a, Her- like a Hercules figure within the religion. And especially in Skyrim, the Nords were really um, into Talos worship because, like I said before... They believed that Talos was once a Nord. They even took it further in their own kind of sect of Talos worship, where they believed that Talos himself came from, like, the old Nordic homeland, which was another continent way up to the north called Admora. So they believed he, like, came from, like, their old homeland, knew, like, their sacred art of you know, the dragon shouting, and then basically just steamrolled the whole continent and put himself on the throne and up into the divinity. So the Nords, out of probably anybody, have the most, like, respect for Talos. Um, Which you see a lot in Skyrim. There's, like, if you explore the wilderness, there's, like, statues of him just, like, everywhere. Like, you'll be just, like, wandering around, and you'll find, like, a glaive in a forest, and in the center of it is just, like, a giant statue of him. And there's, in almost every major city, there's a temple for worshipping just Talos. And then there's, like, another temple for the Nine Divines. So, Nords took Talos' worship, like, really seriously. Elves, on the other hand, didn't. They hated Talos. 
you know, the Nords believed that the elves couldn't stand that, like, a man had achieved divinity and had gone up to be, like, among the divines. Yeah, so the basics you need to know with Talos is that man, like, the men really love him, the elves do not. But again, after the invasion of Tamriel with the giant robot, no one was really willing to argue with him because of said giant robot. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty hard to argue with him when he's got his giant robot bodyguard, like, staring down at you. Yeah, like Richie once said, he wouldn't argue with a baby who had a gun. I wouldn't argue with a giant robot. That's fair. Actually, to kind of contradict myself, the elves did argue with the giant robot and killed it for, like, a while. So let's not, like, they beat it, but at that point it had already done so much damage, they, like, just didn't have the resources to really fight at all anymore. Also, keep that giant robot in mind. Um, it's become super important in a little bit. Oh, I'm fixated on the giant robot. I, I yeah. want to play Elder Scrolls now. <laughs> I hate to tell you, it never shows up. Um, the closest thing is you find like a prototype version of it in a volcano. Dropped. <laughs> <laughs> How does the giant robot compare to Liberty Prime? That's not fair, because I love Liberty Prime, but I hate to say it, I'm pretty sure Numidium, that's the giant robot, could just stomp on Liberty Prime like a bug. Looks like we're going to have to rebuild Liberty Prime to be better and stronger than before. Of course, which is probably what the next Fallout will be about anyway, because that seems to be all they're about anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Talos is the name of a mythical, like, giant... uh giant robot basically from greek myth is that where the name in skyrim comes from i actually assume so i didn't know that until i was like brushing up on stuff for this podcast but i found that and the connection becomes even more apparent later when we get to the bullet point three men in a trench coat (laughs) um which i promise will make sense in a few minutes so google here says Talos could be killed only by removing a bronze peg in his ankle. But what does that make you think of? Talonite. No, do you want it? it gets even more explicit because the the Harryhausen um movie where they fight Talos, it looks exactly the same. Like they're hitting him in the back of the feet and this like stuff is spraying out. So I'm pretty sure wow. like, that yeah, I'm pretty sure that fight is like it's a they someone saw that movie and decided to put it in Demon's Souls. <laughs> Are you saying Miyazaki also watches movies? He's watched Brotherhood of the Wolf and and um That's true. Yeah, so he's watched at least one movie in between reading Berserk. Hey Berserk takes a lot of time to read. I'm like halfway <laughs> That's through true. It right now. I don't I don't blame him. It's long. It's real long. <laughs> Alright, sorry, continue. <laughs> Okay, so before I go on, i kind of realizing that what I've said so far might not be the most clear, so I do want to take a moment to ask if either of you have any questions, because I am about to uh, kind of systematically disprove everything I've just said. Uh, no, I'm, I'm following it pretty well for someone who doesn't know anything about Elder Scrolls. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Yeah. All right, awesome, because most of the stuff I've just told you is, like, bullshit. Oh, no! One thing with Elder Scrolls versus, like, Dark Souls, where in Dark Souls we have, like, kind of a reliable third-party narrator through, like, item descriptions. Elder Scrolls doesn't have anything like that. Most of what we know, like, pretty much everything we know comes from, like, stuff people say, like, old books, and, like, that's really it. Or, like, old songs, too. But because of that, like, a big theme in those games, especially, like, back in Morrowind, is you don't know who's right. Like, um, in Morrowind, the big event was this thing called the Battle of Red Mountain, which actually comes up in Three Men in a Trench Coat. Three Men in a Trench Coat, I promise, is, like, the one that 
blows everything open. <laughs> Low. <laughs> okay. Um, but so, like, the main event of Morrowind was this thing, the Battle of Red Mountain. And there's, like, at least three or four different accounts of what happened that are all, like, wildly different. And those are only the four you really have to consider. There's, like, basically however many people were there is how many different accounts of what happened there are. And you can find right. different books about all of it. And the fun part of that game is you kind of have to come to a decision on what you think happened because that kind of determines how your character, your role playing will go into the end game of that game and like what decisions you'll make. And then Oblivion and Skyrim kind of threw that concept out the window, um, which is disappointing. But oh well. So, we're on to why everything 4th Era Nords believe is wrong, and why they're dumb. Sounds good. So there's a book in Skyrim, it's been in a couple Elder Scrolls games, but like, mostly Skyrim, that talks, of, it's called the Arcturian Heresy, and it gives a very different description of how Talos came about. It describes a man um, who wasn't a Nord. He was a, a race of men called the Bretons, named Halti Earlybeard, who happened to look Nordic. So he was a soldier, and he went to Skyrim and joined um, a Nordic army by just kind of passing off that he was a Nord and no one thought twice about it. Because he just wanted to get out and fight in a war and, like, have war stories to tell, basically. And while he was doing that, he took on the name Tiber Septim. And then during that, a ghost of an old Nordic king came to him, because he was, like, he was doing really well. Like, he was advancing super fast, and this old Nordic king became interested in him, like the ghost of this old Nordic king who died at the Battle of Red Mountain. And so the ghost kind of covertly would help him during battles, which, when the other soldiers saw it, thought he was dragon shouting, which is why there's this whole myth around him that he's dragonborn. Right. Because um, in the games, you know, they say that he came from Atmora, but that's basically impossible. Atmora has been like a lost land for hundreds and hundreds of years. Any expedition that goes there says like it's a wasteland. It's frozen, not just like temperature wise, but like in time. So like nothing happens there. It's just dead, basically. Right. So yeah, basically this king, um, his name was Wolfharth started playing like puppet master with Hjalti and was kind of like working behind the scenes because nobody knew he was still alive or like doing anything. So he was kind of working behind the scenes, helping Hjalti out in battles, killing his rivals, um, anything to advance Hjalti. Because Wolfhart's end goal was to help put somebody back on the throne of the Empire to take revenge on the on Morrowind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next point is pretty interesting. Now we're going to get to the best part, which is three men in a trench coat. From <laughs> here on is where it gets a little weird, and I'm going to have to explain stuff a little bit more in depth. I've been trying to keep it like That's cool. as simple and contained as possible, but we're past that point. This is when it gets weird. <laughs> right. Okay, so Hjalti and um, Wolfharth together, best buddies, go and they take the ruby throne, which is what the um, like imperial throne is called. It's the ruby throne and the white gold tower. So they take the city. Um, at this point, Hjalti is still a general. So they assassinate his king kind of through um, espionage. Not espionage, I can't think of the right word. Subterfuge? Either way, they kill him, and instead yeah. they put Hjalti on the throne. 
who, like I said, is now going under the name of Tiber Septum. Also, during this, um, Hjalti kind of bites the bullet and slits his own throat. Not to kill himself, but to make an excuse for why he's not dragon shouting anymore. Oh. Yeah, because Wolfhart's getting weaker. Also, it makes it look like he didn't kill his king, Kula Kane. Because if he got attacked too, it probably wasn't him. Even though it absolutely was. So they got pretty sneaky with it. Which backfires almost immediately because somebody finds them out, like, a few days later. And that man is, um, an Imperial man who lived in the White Gold Tower. He was, like, the old... He's, like, a old, wise wizard figure, kind of like, um, like a court wizard there. And he, he's been watching Kelty as well, and he approaches him and basically says, Hey, I know you're working with Wolfarth. Um, so yeah, Zern Arctis confronts them and says basically that he knows what they're doing because he's been watching Hjalti and knows that he's lying. Um, also knows he killed Kula Kane. But now he's the Emperor, so Zern is like, I'm not mad, I want to work with you guys. So now, Hjalti, Earlybeard, Zern Arctis, and Wolfharth make a plan. And that plan is for all of them to start going under the name Tiber Septum. So now they're all technically acting as the emperor of the empire. Because at this point, it's not all of Tamriel, it's a small portion of it. And they decide that they're going to split up, each under this new identity of Tiber Septum, and go and act on the Empire's behalf as the Emperor in separate parts of the country. Um, Because nobody, you know, back then... um, This is going to be a loaded statement to say, but, like, at this point in Elder Scrolls, the internet had um, fallen. Like, there's no more magical internet, because that was a thing for a while. What? (laughs) Right? (laughs) Sorry, there's like there was this whole golden age back in the Raymond Empire where they had like lunar colonies, space stations, the internet. So they this isn't in any of the games. You don't go to the lunar colonies. We've never gone to a lunar colony. We have been to one oh. of the battle stations in like an old shitty spin-off game called Battle Spire. Right. Um which I didn't mention before, but I did play for 5 minutes and then quit immediately cuz it's basically unplayable. Excellent. Yeah. Um, But no, kind of like um, Dark Souls. All the cool stuff has already happened. Throughout all the games, you're kind of going through a dark age in the world of um, the Elder Scrolls. Which is like a theme that they still have going on, where like, um, as the worlds get more complex, the ways you can edit it with magic gets less complex. So, like, back in the first games, you had, like, spells that would let you fly past wall spells that let you walk right through walls. But the reason they could do that back then is because the walls were, like, in the game, you know, they were, like, super thin. They weren't, like, an actual rendered wall, so you just pop onto the other side. But now, like, with the 3D and everything, you can't do that anymore. So they've just had to say, like, oh, people forgot how to do that. Or, like, there's no levitation magic in Skyrim, and the excuse is, oh, that knowledge was, like, lost. Right. So, during the games, the the whole world, really, is kind of going through a dark age. Alright, but I'm off topic. (laughs) So, like I said, Zurin Arctis, Hjalti Earlybeard, Wolfhearth, they're all best friends. And they're all technically Tiber Septim. They're acting under this kind of alias of Tiber Septim. Um, so they're all out doing their thing. Hjalti goes and starts invading continent or countries. And after a while, they kind of reconvene. And um, Hjalti and Zurin, they're talking about invading Morrowind. But Hjalti and Zurin are scared because Morrowind has this thing called the Tribunal, which are, according to the people of Morrowind, three living gods who are, like, the most powerful things on the continent. And 
this really freaks out Zer and, and um, Yalti. They're like, well, we can't deal with that, so we should just try to, like, make peace with them. However, Wolfharth is not on board with this at all. Um, Wolfharth was actually killed by a member of the tribunal. The only reason he had done any of this was to go and eventually kill the tribunal because he was so pissed at them. So now his friends, who he's been doing all this stuff with, with this end goal in mind, are like, oh yeah, we're not actually going to do that. So Wolfharth just gets mad and he leaves. He just, like, leaves and doesn't come back. Leaving just Hjalti, Early Beard, and Zer and Arctis there by themselves. Now, in this time, while they've been doing this, um, they've kind of been doing something unintentionally in Elder Scrolls, which is referred to as mantling. To explain it simply, mantling is the act of acting so much like another person or entity that you just kind of become them. Like physically or mentally? Well, both. Kind of both. You... Right. It's a little confusing, because you kind of retain your indiv- like individuality, but at the same... Like, you're both part of, like, a bigger entity, which is what they did. They kind of unintentionally made this um, mantle of Tiber Septum, or Tiber Septum and unintentionally, like, through making such a legend around him and through doing so much in the world, through kind of the collective consciousness of all the people in the world, they kind of just made this fake person real. Which isn't, like, super important at this point, but it becomes important later. So, Kjalti and Zurin... Um, decide to go through with their plan now that Wolfarth is gone, and they go to Morrowind to negotiate with the Tribunal, who are the god kings of Morrowind. And they meet with one of them named Vivek, who is, like, probably the most important character in Test lore, but also really weird and hard to talk about. So we're going to keep the Vivek stuff brief and just say Vivek agreed to be part of the Empire, and as kind of a like a gift to show that he was genuine about it, he gave them Numidium. They just kind of had it lying around. A giant killer robot. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, just take this. We'll be in the Empire. We won't cause trouble. We're just going to do our thing, which is objectively terrible. But just ignore that, and we'll keep, you guys can do your thing with our giant robot. Arguably, Vivek is a god of lying and, like, kind of tricking people. So, obviously, after getting a giant killer robot, Zurin and um, Hjalti are like, oh, this is great. Let's go turn it on and go crush everything. And they drag it home. They drag it all the way from Morrowind back to the Imperial City and realize that Vivek didn't give them the batteries. Aww. <laughs> Yeah, so they're they're real bummed out about this for a long time, and they they're like, "What what do we do with this thing?" And Zurin, being a wizard, is like, "I'm gonna go. I'm gonna do some research and see what I can come up with." Because as far as Numidium goes, you can't just go like make. Well, you kind of can. But it's hard to make new batteries for Numidium because its powered, its original power source was the heart of the dead god Lorcan, who I haven't mentioned yet, even though he's like penultimately important for Talos, because Lorcan is super confusing. But I'm gonna do my best. So, a bit of a callback. Remember how earlier I said the birth of the ninth divine again? Right. Lorcan was the original Ninth Divine. Back when the Divines were making the world, Lorcan was the one who had originally come to them with the idea, like, hey, we should make a plane of, like, mortality. Because back then, everything was infinite, time didn't exist, all the, di- the original spirits, as they called themselves back then, just kind of were. But Lorcan, 
was kind of, he was a spirit of change. So he was like, what if we made a world where things like begin and end and are constantly changing and nothing is certain? And he convinced all the other divines to help him make this world. However, depending on what religious beliefs you adhere to, Lorcan kind of tricked them. Lorcan was like, yeah, you guys make this and you'll be in charge and I'll just kind of observe what you guys are doing. And in making this like material plane, basically, the other eight divines nearly like died in the process. Like they were severely weakened. And like I said, Lorcan just kind of stood off to the side and let them do that. It's debatable whether or not he knew it would do that to them. So, of course, the other gods are super mad about this. And at an event called Convention where they were going to kind of finalize the world, they called Lorcan there under the false pretenses that he was going to come kind of do a final revision on everything. And instead, they cut out his heart. Damn. Try to smash it. The heart laughs at them. Oh, wow. And so um, Ariel or Akatosh or Alduin or whatever you want to call him uh, puts it on his bow and shoots it as far away as he can, which honestly wasn't all that far. <laughs> but it makes it to Morrowind, sinks into the ground, causes a giant volcano. <laughs> Much later, the dwarves came along, found it, were like, hey, we can definitely use this. Built a giant robot named Numidium. And um, then they all died, <laughs> hmm. which is why all the dwarves are gone by the time you play Skyrim. So that's everything you kind of need to know about Lorcon. I feel like I threw a lot out in that little rant. Do you guys have any questions? I, I'm just sort of continue to be baffled that all the stuff about robots and lunar colonies and the internet isn't in the game. No, I know. <laughs> I know. It's, it's upsetting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so going back to our merry band, who have now broken up, Zirin learns all of this, and he learns that the original power source for the Numidium was the heart of Lorcan, which is lost, because Dagother is sitting under a mountain somewhere, like, eating it, but that's not important. So he can't get that. So he's like, well, what do we do? Because... I mean, we have this giant robot. It's just kind of taking up space. We got to do something with it. So while he's researching all this stuff, he figures out that Wolfharth was there at the Battle of Red Mountain where Numidium was first activated and that that's how he died. So he gets kind of suspicious of that and he starts looking more into Wolfharth and figures out that Wolfharth is thump, uh, something called a Shezarine, which is a mortal person born, and their soul is a fragment of Lorcan's soul. So with that information, he starts looking at the Numidium and Wolfharth, and he says, maybe we could trick Numidium into thinking that Wolfharth's soul is Lorcan's soul. Right. Yeah, it's a little iffy, but, I mean, they're doing their best with what they've got. Getting into Soul Reaver territory here. <laughs> I don't know what that is either. Wait, 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 I'm looking at the Legacy of Cain release date. Oh, this was before that. This no, was Blood like, Omen, sorry, no. I mean Blood Omen release date. Blood Omen's like 96, I think. Yeah, you wouldn't know what it is, sorry, Blood. <laughs> All right. Yeah, November 1st, 96. Of course, the podcast with the most references I don't understand is the one that I'm on. <laughs> <sighs> okay. So, Zurin and Yalti call up Wolfharth, and they're like, hey, you know, we're sorry about what happened. We've decided to invade Morrowind because they're being mean or something. So we want you to come back. We're getting the band back together and we're going to invade Morrowind together. And Wolfharth is super excited and he sh immediately leaves to go back. 
In the meantime, Zer and Arctis has crafted a gem, a soul gem, to um, fit Wolfhar's soul into. So their plan is he's going to show up, he's going to be super excited, he won't be expecting to get murdered, which will make it the perfect time to murder him. Um, even though he's a ghost, I don't <laughs> just accept that. So he shows up, he's super excited, and then Zurin comes up behind him with what must have been a magic dagger and immediately stabs him. Wolfharth obviously doesn't take super kindly to this and uh, blows him up, blows up Zirin, who, unwitting to anyone involved in the situation, is also a Shezarine. So he, his soul is also a fragment of Lorcan's soul. So this gem they made ends up absorbing both their souls. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, Hjalti is sitting on the other side of the room, just witnessed this, and starts to smile to himself, because he's like, oh, now I have everything to myself. So he immediately goes over, plugs the batteries in, gets the remote control they made for Numidium, and turns it on. Which, every time Numidium gets turned on, it is a bad time. Do you think that the Liberty Prime thing in Fallout 3 is that some Bethesda employees were frustrated you don't get to do this in Elder Scrolls? (laughs) Honestly, maybe. Um, I don't know um, how many writers from Elder Scrolls worked on the Fallout series. Because, okay, I don't know if you want to put this in the podcast because this is a little iffy. According to rumors online, a majority of Elder Scrolls lore was written by one guy who, again, this is allegedly, I'm not saying this is true, I don't know. <laughs> but apparently he locked himself in his apartment for a week and did nothing but work on writing all this Elder Scrolls lore. He didn't go to work, so eventually his co-workers got worried, broke into his apartment, found him with like multiple cartons of cigarettes, um, multiple bottles of whiskey, and like... And a giant robot. Uh, no, mostly <laughs> psychedelics. Um, oh my god. Just like lying on the floor in his underwear. And oh he's just god. like, guys, I did it. I wrote, don't worry, I wrote the story. It does kind of fit with some of the things you've described. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> especially back in Morrowind. Like, this, surprisingly enough, is some of the tamer stuff in Elder Scrolls lore. Right. Some of it gets really, really out there. Especially, I didn't know a way to fit this in, but I do. I was thinking about this because I, I wanted to mention it just because it's cool. Originally, the game that would become Morrowind was like wildly different. The concept of the game was that you were like space pirates <laughs> mm-hmm. in a spaceship made out of mathematical equations. Right. Okay. Um. Metal was super rare, so everyone had armor made out of bug shells, which actually made it into Morrowind. And you would fight by shooting cannonballs at each other, but a big mechanic of the game was going to be that, um, since metal was so rare, you had a limited amount of cannonballs, and each one had, like, a name and, like, a personality. Oh, wow. Which sounds, like, really cool. I want this. Yeah, same. And, like, the bad guys were, like... These weird space vampires with, like, harp pistols. So they were, like, little musical right. instruments and also guns. This is sounding like, um, like Spelljammer, the D&D setting. Yeah, from... Which we never really got a game of, yeah. Which, from what I've heard, um, the guy who wrote that really likes Spelljammer. Yeah, that sounds like it. There's a lot of stuff in one of the Morrowind DLCs that I've heard... Because I've never played Spelljammer. I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, but we never played that. But, like, at one point in one of the Morrowind DLCs, you go into this, like, dungeon, and the deeper you go, the more technologically advanced it gets to the point where, like, there's, like, circuitry. That's really cool. Yeah, it's super cool, and, like, they just don't... They've been slowly taking that stuff out of the games, which I hate. Yeah. Because they're... Yeah, it's like... uh... It's like wizardry in reverse. Like wizardry starts off as just D and D, and then by wizardry seven, there's like hoverbikes. 
Yeah, which is cool. Um, yeah. Uh, by the end of this, we'll, like, um, in uh, Space Battles, Exploding Paintings, The Bachelor Party at the End of the Universe and Kime, we'll get into some of this cooler stuff that no longer exists. <laughs> okay, so where was I? Oh, yeah. Okay, so Zurin and Wolfarth both dead. Uh, both their souls have been crammed inside Numidium. And Kjalti is standing there with Numidium, and he's like, hey, pretty cool. And so then Numidium kind of awakens. Uh-huh. And it looks around, and it can tell that um, what is powering it is not the heart of Lorcan. And it's something different, but it's sure as hell similar to Lorcan. Like, really similar. Like, similar enough that it might as well just be Lorcan. So, Numidium basically kind of checks with the Godhead, which is like the ultimate god of the Elder Scrolls universe, who, <laughs> obviously from the Bloodborne podcast, I'm guessing you guys know a little bit about H.P. Lovecraft. A little bit, yeah. All right, do you know Azathoth? The... Yeah. All right. Basically, the godhead is Azathoth. Everything is in his dream, but he's not conscious of it. Which is kind of how mantling works, because as long as you two look and kind of act similar enough, the godhead's not keeping close enough track to tell you apart, so you just become each other. So that's basically what Numidium does. He checks with the godhead. He says, hey, this looks, this seems a lot like Lorcan, is it? And the godhead kind of lazily is just like, yeah, whatever, that's Lorcan. <laughs> so. However, like I said, when you mantle, you kind of remain individuals, but, like, individuals with the same soul. So Numidium looks back and he's like, okay, I know the godhead's wrong, but it's convenient for me if you are Lorcan. But just to tell you two apart, we're going to code you as the TAL operating system, which is where Talos comes from. Oh, Talos. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, people might not agree with that, but it sounds cool. Um, I've I've read it somewhere on a forum a few times, I think. And anyway, it's a cool idea. Um, I don't think there's enough cool ideas in Elder Scrolls anymore. So as far as I'm concerned, it's canon. Excellent. And since Numidium looks at Zirin and Wolfharth and decides that they're Lorcan or Talos, basically the same thing at this point. And they were both Tiber Septum, and so is Kelty. Now he, who is also Tiber Septum, now he's also Talos, who is also Lorcan. Mm hmm. Okay, yeah, like I said, this is when it gets confusing. So <laughs> now Talos is like, cool, got my giant robot. I'm gonna go crush everything that doesn't agree with me. And he does that. And he goes and he conquers all of Tamriel. He gets to the Somerset Isles, which is where the High Elves live. They defeat Numidium by kind of throwing him into an alternate timeline for a few hundred years. But at that point, the High Elves are so devastated by its initial attack, they they just surrender. Because one thing about Numidium is that it really confuses Akatosh, the Time God. Um, So... The time, like whenever Numidium is around, the timeline kind of splits. So multiple different things can happen at once. Um, the invasion of the Somerset Isle is often referred to as happening overnight and over a hundred years, all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Just know that sometimes when Numidium is involved, multiple conflicting things can happen in different timelines, and then when he gets shut down again they collapse back into each other and the different timelines just kind of have to come to terms with each other for lack of a better phrase, which is what happened in the Somerset Isles, which is why the war was so devastating. So for some people, while it was only overnight for different people, it was like a 50 year war. And then all those timelines coming together just kind of ruined everything for them for a while. Mm hmm. So that's Numidium. Also, kind of unintentionally, made myself a good segue for talking about um, the elves a bit more. There's some elves in the house. There's some (laughs) elves in the house. My brother keeps showing me that song and also claims it's the only (laughs) song he listens to anymore. And I'm kind of sick of it. 
Sin has been singing it nonstop for about a fortnight. Oh lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um So um elves <laughs> really hate Talos. And if you ask a Nord and all his great correct opinions, he will tell you that elves just really don't like men. So they really don't like that a man became a god, right? Mm -hmm. In reality, the conflict between elves and men and their gods in general goes like way deeper than that. So Sin, I don't know if you remember this from Skyrim, but do you remember who the Thalmor are? Are they like the elves that think they're better than everyone else? That's them. Yeah, I remember. Okay. So, and you know how, like, in Skyrim, they're going through that civil war, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why there's the civil war in Skyrim is because the Thalmor invaded the fourth empire of man and nearly destroyed it. And um, as part of the surrender, the empire of man surrendered to the Thalmor. One of the things they had to do in order to secure the surrender uh, peacefully was to outlaw the worship of Talos. Which really pissed off pretty much every Nord in existence. However, like I said before, the Nords think it's just because um, elves don't like that Talos used to be a human. The real reason is because Talos is Lorcan. And whereas in human culture, Talos and Lorcan are both revered as like hero gods, and they are the spirits who made the world for them to live in and everything good that comes with it. Elves believe the total opposite. They think of the world as a punishment. They think that um, Lorcan tricked the other divines into kind of locking mortals away from their divine sort of inheritance. They view um, mortality and life itself as a curse. Um, something to be risen above. Mm -hmm. So the reason they're outlawing or outlawing the worship of Talos is because, in so many, you know, after a few leaps in um logic, it just becomes worship of Lorcan, who they really, really do not get along with in a theological sense. Right. To the point where they're trying to just kind of eradicate him from the universe itself. They're absolutely tired of him. They hate him. They want him gone. Which is why, like, that whole civil war is happening in um, Skyrim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to think of anything else I want to talk about quick before we get to point nine. Because that's... This is when everything gets... Uh, confusing, kind of controversial, just because whether or not it's canon, yeah, what actually happens, what's not. So, right, and not everything I've said up until now might not be like explicitly canon, but we're gonna get into territory that's like almost explicitly not canon, but it's still cool. All right. <laughs> So what have we got? Space battles, exploding paintings, bachelor parties, and Kaim. I guess we'll start with Kaim. Yeah. So in Test Lore, I mentioned earlier um, the Godhead, and how he's sort of like um, Azathoth in the sense that he's dreaming everything that exists and isn't aware of it. There's a process you can go through in Elder Scrolls where you can realize like the nature of the universe, that you're part of a dream of this giant entity called the Godhead. In doing so, you kind of, you realize that you're not real in the way you thought you were. Mm -hmm. And for some people, when they make this realization, um, it's such a powerful realization and seems like such a powerful truth that when they realize they're not real, they convince themselves of it so thoroughly that they stop existing, which is a process called zero-summing. Which, it's speculated that the dwarves did that accidentally when they first turned on Numidium, but 
no one really knows exactly what happened to the dwarves. But that's one theory, is that they, as an entire kind of people, all zeros summed at the same time when they turned on that giant robot. Exactly opposite of that, um, when you realize you're not real, you can kind of just talk back to it and say, well, yes, I am. Uh, which requires a huge amount of ego to do. Basically, if you're self-centered enough, you can just kind of brute force your way past the realization. And in doing so, you achieve something called, um, I call it Kaim, some people call it Chim, it doesn't matter. Which, basically, for an undisclosed amount of time, you just sort of become the godhead. Right. At which point, you can sort of do... You kind of just mantle the godhead. You realize that, like, in a sense, since you're part of the dream, you're part of the dreamer. And for, like, maybe a brief moment, you can kind of ascend to that level where you can alter the dream. And you can alter reality. Which, apparently, Talos did that when he activated Numidium. And the reason why this is thought is because back before Oblivion came out, there was a, um, an unofficial book from um, the wiki written by the writer of the games called The Pocket Guide to the Empire, which went through and described all the different provinces of the Empire. The part that describes Cyrodiil described it as a huge swamp slash like jungle area. And then when you play Oblivion, it's not that at all. It's like hills and like pine forests and like it's not a jungle at all. So the idea is that when Talos achieved Kaim, he changed the whole landscape of Cyrodiil to better fit the humans who were living there now. But then in ESO, you go back there in the second era and it's also not a jungle. So. I I don't know what's going on with that. Some people think he like went back and changed it retroactively, like changed it so that it had always been like that. But the books written back then weren't changed. It's it's weird. Yeah. And doesn't make much sense and honestly, they just didn't want to design a big swamp for a huge game like that and then <laughs> I should have hired Miyazaki. <laughs> right? He's great at swamps. Yeah. Honestly, I'd kind of love to see a game or anything written by Miyazaki and um, the guy who wrote Elder Scrolls lore. They're not similar, but they're both kind of crazy in the same way. Like, weird fantasy stuff, which I love. Like, just really weird fantasy stuff, especially when, like, sci-fi gets included. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about that with reference to, like, at least early, early D and D in the seventies, where there's just sort of, it's very malleable. Like there's, it's there's that obvious Tolkien influence, but they don't mind just bringing whatever they feel like into it. And like we mentioned, Spelljammer. Like, what if there was space travel? And there's also like, there's just like like dinosaurs and giant bugs and like Cthulhu is in there, and but also Satan. Like it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just whatever like, nerdy stuff we like and want to put in this. Which I like. I like the idea of just, like, whatever seems cool, just throw it in. We'll figure it out later. Who cares, you know? I kind of like that. Except for, like, in Dark Souls 3, where they just took a bunch of stuff and then threw it together and didn't really know what to do with it. Watching your guys' podcast of Dark Souls 3 has made me realize, like, it's upsetting to me because, like, the cut content stuff sounds so cool. Like, it, I don't yeah. want to say it seems like it would have been a better game. It really kind of does. Um, and it's just so... It would have, would have been a more consistent game. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they might have cut it because it was bad, but it would have made, like, more narrative sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is actually kind of a problem in Elder Scrolls Lore 2, or just in Elder Scrolls in general, because, like I mentioned earlier, that game that turned into Morrowind sounds really, really cool. Like, just completely off the wall, like, space vampires and, like, weird yeah, yeah, ships definitely. made of math. Like, 
I'd love to see that, but it'll never happen. Well, maybe Elden Ring. I know nothing about Elden Ring, honestly. No one knows anything about Elden Ring. It could literally be anything. Who knows? Maybe there are spaceships. Yeah. Maybe there are mafia babies in those spaceships. Honestly, I'd be down. I'd love to see what they could do with that. (laughs) Who are we kidding? Miyazaki would never put immortal babies into a game. Yeah. Well, maybe you could blow up the spaceship with the babies on it. So it'd be like off screen, but Miyazaki could still get the joy of actually killing an infant for once. I've I've got it. I've got it. The babies are immortal because they're already dead. (laughs) There we go. It's like Derasane with the fairies. Oh my god. It kind of fits the theme of Dark Souls where all the stuff you want to see happened off screen. So like, Mm -hmm. in his mind, Miyazaki knows like those babies met their end. (laughs) And that's enough for him. He's just like, it happened somewhere, sometime, and that's enough for me at this point. (laughs) Excellent. He really does try to put that in like every game he makes now, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He's obsessed with the demon child from Berserk. Oh. I think it's just that. That makes a lot. I kind of forgot about the demon child because yeah. I'm very yeah. not obsessed with it and I think it's gross and I don't like when it's in the it story. Is. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, it, it's disgusting. It really freaks me out. And whenever it shows up, I'm just like, oh, oh, Lord, please keep that away from from me. But no, sorry, we're getting I'm getting off topic. We're all getting off topic. (laughs) Okay, so that's Kaim. Kaim is super confusing. No one has ever agreed on what it is, how to pronounce it, what it does, how to achieve it, how long. No one knows anything about it, and we never will, because it's just not in the games anymore. So, that's that's Kaim. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you want to hear about exploding paintings or the bachelor party at the end of the universe next? Oh, whichever. Okay, exploding paintings is a little easier to talk about. It's mostly cut content ideas from back when um, the original writer for Morrowind, Michael Kirkbride, was going to play a bigger role in writing for Skyrim. Where um, it's never really been explained how or why this was happening. Um, I was just watching something he was doing, and he he mentions a lot of stuff, like, offhanded. And you're like, oh, that sounds really cool. And then he's like, yeah, but I don't know. I don't care about it. And it's like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> but he mentioned, so, like, you know the symbol for Skyrim, like, the dragon um, diamond shape that, like, makes the dragon? Yeah. That's the symbol of Talos. Oh. And there was going to be, like, a weird, I don't know if it was going to be, like, just a thing that you would find, or if it was, like, something that would happen in the game, but the idea was, like, because the Thalmor had done so much in eradicating Talos worship, Talos was, like, dying. So the symbol that represents him was, like, unstable, in a way. Mm-hmm. So, the way he described it is, like, if you made a flag with that symbol on it, the flag would then shred to pieces. Like, you couldn't get the flag to, like, stay together. Or, like, if you tried to paint the symbol from memory, like, the paint would smear kind of on its own away from that shape. Or the best one was, um, he described, like, a bunch of Talos worshippers kind of in a circle as one guy sang about it and the idea was they would all imagine it in their heads and you would find the aftermath of that which is when they imagine it in their head their head just exploded (laughs) wow which is super weird and sounds like a really cool idea but it just never got implemented into the game which it's i don't know much about cut content as it relates to Skyrim, and I don't think many people do. But I do know that the original story for Skyrim was about, like, an old Septim, like, Septim Emperor coming back from, like, another continent in order to reclaim his throne. 
mm-hmm. and coming back with like an army of dragons, which is why originally the dragons were coming back. Because as it stands now in the game, the reason the dragons are coming back in Skyrim doesn't make any sense to me, like, at all. And I've gone to, like, pretty great lengths in order to, like, make excuses for the story of Skyrim and kind of write a weird roundabout explanation for how it could make sense. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's better than what I feel they presented you in the game. Right. Because they just kind of... Skyrim does this weird thing where it it mentions all this cool stuff. So, like, there's a mission in Skyrim where you meet a ghost who was friends with Tiber Septim. But he calls you Hjalti, like like he thinks you're Hjalti Earlybeard. Which kind of proves that the events of the Arcturian heresy and, like, everything with Zira and Arctis, Hjalti and Wolfharth is true, and that what the Nords think is wrong... But that's one unmarked quest that you get in an unmarked location in the middle of nowhere. And they just, like, breeze right over it. And if you're not paying attention, really, um, you just won't think anything of it. It's super weird because they mention all this, like, really cool lore stuff that they used to have. But, like, when it's mentioned, it's just super brief. They don't talk about it much, and then they drop it immediately. But yeah, that's about it. All I have left is um, the uh, Bachelor Party, which um, is an event that takes place in a... There's this thing called Coda, which is the script for a comic book that the writer, Michael Kirkbride, wants to get made one day. It's about a lunar colony of Dark Elves living in the Fifth Era after Numidian has come back and destroyed the world in an event called Landfall. The point of the story is Vivek, who I mentioned earlier, um, is trying to conceive a child in order to dream up a new universe for them to escape to and kind of become the new godhead. And the main character, Jubaldun Sul, I think is his name. I might be getting that wrong, and if I am, I apologize. He's sort of a messiah figure, which is like the first line is like, I have a messiah complex, my name is Jubal. And it's like, okay, man, cool. (laughs) and so like he goes he cuts off his hands he gets married to Vivek he smokes a lot of skooma which is like a narcotic from the Elder Scrolls he goes up to the surface of the moon meets with Numidium who you kind of figure out Numidium's purpose in that which was to eradicate the entire universe and then, in that final scene, Jubalu and Sul and Numidium have an argument. And it's, it's really weird. It's hard to explain, but basically everything Jubal says, Numidium just rebuttals with an empty speech bubble until Jubal kind of calls him out. And then Jubal has really, the entire time, been trying to learn how to do that with the empty speech bubble. And near the end of the argument, he figures out how to do it and he uses an empty speech bubble to cut off Numidium's head. This is like Grant Morrison, what? I, I, okay, that's why I saved this for the end, because, like, it gets really weird there at the end. No, and my, I'm just going, like, what, this this is the same as, like, the one with the Vikings? Yep. Yep. Okay. I, I don't know, um, how else to explain it. I think Koda was... Well, like, because Coda is explicitly not canon. If you go to the test lore subreddit, they will very vehemently remind you that Coda is not canon at all. <laughs> but in my opinion, it's like the most interesting thing that's happened in Elder Scrolls since 2001, maybe. So, I don't know. As long as it's cool, I consider it canon. <laughs> so... The reason I even bring it up is because Talos shows up and kind of mid-conversation every once in a while shifts from being Talos to being Lorcan, and then we'll go back to being Talos. I've read Coda a few times. It's one of the most confusing things I've ever read. There's almost no pictures, because it's supposed to be a comic book, 
but he just hasn't been able to find anyone who can draw this what he wants people to draw because it's bizarre and most of the descriptions don't make sense. Like in Coda, there's these things called the digitals, which are like these floating hands made out of binary code. And I, I've i tried to understand, I've talked to people, I've looked up like explanations. And that's still the best description I can give you of a digital is that they're a big floating hand made out of binary code. I have no, they're like a big part of what Coda is about, I think. But I just don't understand, like, it's completely, parts of it come off as, like, complete nonsense. <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird. I hope it gets made one day, but it's, it's bizarre. But yeah, oh yeah, they're at Jubal's bachelor party, after he cuts off his hands, and he's smoking skooma, and Talos shows up and, like, congratulates him. And then they go and fight Numidium. It happens really fast, and you like don't know that's what he's going to do, but then Numidium just shows up and is like, hey, I'm here after destroying the whole planet, so what's up? <laughs> and that's it. That's um, pretty much everything that I know about Talos, in lore, out of lore, and which lore I think is correct and which lore I think is wrong. Well, that was that was a trip. It gets that's why I formatted it like that. I was like, okay, this yeah, stuff at yeah. the start's pretty easy to digest, even if you don't know much about it. Like, you should be able to follow. And then by the end, I'm just gonna sound like uh, Mikalash raving in his library. <laughs> <laughs> that was Vlad with the extremely weird story of Elder Scrolls. <laughs> Uh, Vlad, do you have any social media where you might want people to check you out? Um, I do have a Twitter with like three followers, um, badvlad1. In one word? Yeah, all one word. The um, bad and Vlad are capitalized. Is one a number or a letter? Um, a number. Perfect. Cool. Thank you, Vlad. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming. It was super informative. We learned a lot. Well, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Remember how I said Talos has the Infinity Gauntlet with the stones? Uh Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was wrong. Talos is actually a Skrull general who tried to save the Kree Empire. Is this another thing that came out before I was born? The first appearance of Talos is in fact Incredible Hulk number 418, released in 1994.